In this video, we're going to take a look at what vendors refer to as fileless malware or non-malware malware using LogMD Professional. We recently were on Breaking Down Security Podcast talking about this very subject, so please take a listen to episode 2017-016, Fileless Malware, for more information on what fileless malware is and some of the thoughts we had on the subject and some new, um, let's just say some new uh, words we can use to help describe the components of fileless malware, which I think you'll see as a part of this video. So let's get started. The first thing we want to do is run logmd, and in order to do that, we need to know what options there are. So if you run logmd-h, it'll give you all the options that logmd professional has. And just again, minus H is all you need, and you can see all the options here that are available to you. Watch our other videos on how to, to uh, use each one of these um, items, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and just show you real quick. We're going to just run logmd uh, minus one. I've cleared the logs to make this very fast. It's going to go through and collect the uh, reports, and the thing to note here is that the reports at the top that have data are the ones we want to look at. So there's an interesting artifacts report, PowerShell, etc. And the ones below and the bottom don't have any data, which means we know from a log perspective that there's nothing interesting to look at here. There's no WMI pwnage or WinRM pwnage or Windows Defender didn't trigger on or anything. And that's generally how you collect the, the logs with the minus one. We'll minimize this window. I just wanted to show you that so you have an understanding of how that works because I've already generated the uh, reports for us here, make things a little quicker. All right, so where do we start? Well, uh, LogMD Professional has a unique feature called interesting artifacts. And what that is, is when we, de when we detect certain uh, very specific things that we consider to be absolute pwnage, for example, the shift key hitting it five times brings up accessibility options. People have probably done this um, by accidentally, and there it is, there's a, a command prompt by pressing the shift key five times. And this is known as the sticky keys exploit. And uh, the idea here is if you have this on your system, yeah, your system's compromised. Somebody has done this exploit to your box, and now at any given time, whether your system's locked or not, can get an administrative prompt. And so that's one of the things we looked at. Uh, that is not part of this malware. I just added that for the demo. And the other component that we look at is a, that we consider a really interesting artifact is something that occurred in this particular malware we are using, and that is a null byte in the registry. And that's used because when a null byte is entered into a value of a key, it causes regedit or regquery or some other tools to actually throw an error, and it does not display the actual value or data that's in that key. And that's pretty cool because it's a way to obfuscate things, right? And so we want to look at that because it did trigger. And that's always, that's always the first thing I'll look at if I see that report. And I'll go ahead and open these up, and I'll blow this up a little bit so it's easier to read. And we can see here that here's the exploit sticky keys. Again, not part of this malware. This is just something I added to the box. And we show you that the exploit sticky keys occurred, and that set HC, which is the shift key five times, equals the hash of the command.exe, and it's located in system 32. Um, that is definitely one thing we look at. The other is, which is part of this malware, is the fact that there were some null bytes written. And so reg registry obfuscation is occurring by the fact that the bad guys are putting a null byte in the value of the key. In this case, we now have an artifact to focus on, D-E-K-J and Q-L-C-H-T-K-U-F-Q. And there's a null byte, and they're in the run key. Now just note, whenever you see duplicate values like this, it's the same. HK current user happens to also be HK users and the security ID. That's why there's multiple entries. If you were to see multiple security IDs, then you would know multiple users have this problem. So in this case, it's only the HK current user. And we now have a key, the run key, and we have a value that we're going to look at. So that's immediately something we know that's, that's interesting. This box is definitely compromised. Normally, though, you're not going to get an interesting artifact unless you are dealing with some of this uh, null byte type stuff or somebody has actually done a sticky key exploit. Uh, most of the time, this doesn't trigger unless you're using this, this fancy malware. Um, and so the first place we start is think of it like the snake at the very beginning. The head of the snake has fangs, which we consider to be the auto runs or persistence. The venom is the payload, so that's the main thing that the malware is launching from the persistence auto run. And then the body, all the different other artifacts and reg keys that are involved with the malware. And then the thing that makes noise, the logs, which captures the behavior we're going to see here. So let's take a look at what we see in the auto runs. Now, logmd, you'll have to watch a video on, on using logmd auto runs for professional. Uh, logmd professional auto runs, because uh, we have the ability of filtering out 
uh, much better and easier than free does the auto runs to make this report just like it is here. We have a master digest that can be applied so any of the hashes that are found in the master digest, if I blow this up, any of the hashes that are in the master digest are removed from this report which makes it really nice to uh, be able to see um, uh, less data which makes it easier to see this stick out right these bad auto runs that stick out or new auto runs are not necessarily bad yet we don't know that yet and if we scroll over here uh, we can see two auto runs this this matches exactly what we saw in the interesting artifact report we can see there's the null bytes so we widen this up and there's the null bytes so we definitely know that interesting artifacts you know good but now we have more data we actually see the the execution so we have this big long execution up here we actually have a folder now, uh, app data local 3466, and a link file, 9e53.link. So you kind of pay attention to the format of this. And we have also a startup folder item. And if we scroll over here, you can see it's a startup folder. So we have a run key and a startup folder. And you know, the run key is actually found here. And we can also see in it that there's a same formatted LNK file, see this 9E53 looks very similar to this EA7E link. So we know that there is a shortcut in the startup folder, and we can look at that right now by going to the startup folder. I'll drag the property over once I right click the properties. Come over here, and we can see that there's a long command, and very quickly you'll determine that it is the same command that's being loaded by the run key. MSHTA, JavaScript, blah, 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 blah. And you can see here that it matches what's going on here. So this malware persists in two places, the run key and the startup folder. That means it probably is going to have a multi-load or two of that item. And we'll look at that a little later. Um, but that's a good giveaway. We have two persistence mechanisms, and we have two different shortcuts. So we know this malware uses shortcuts. It's using MSHTA, the built-in Microsoft HTML uh, application that uh, allows you to do command line uh, browsing stuff. Um, and let's see, the other artifact we have is the fact that there's a folder involved, app data local 3466. So now we have things to investigate. But first, we want to take a closer look at this long key here. Now, we know it's running MSHDA. That's the process that started or was created. So we're going to look at that report in a second to say, all right, MSTHA executed, and that will give us the ability to look at the behavior that occurred. We can scroll down here and see a bunch of other stuff. We can see WScript was involved. And something that sticks out immediately is there's a reference to HKey current user software FLPRU. Um, now, that's important because that's, uh, again, we saw that in the uh, in the sticky bits as well, but um, the fact that there's a key reference is generally not, oops, I'm going to get back over there where I can see the whole amount of data. The, the fact that we can see this uh, key, I'm trying to expand this so we can see it all, and uh, Excel's not cooperating when I'm in the larger font, right? Here's the key down here, or, or up here, that uh, we have a key, in a command line, that's pretty unusual. You generally will not ever see that. So that's an immediately something I, I will focus on. And so I want to make note that HKey Current User Software FLPRU is a key I need to look at. All right. So app data local 3466, software FLPRU, and we have some shortcuts. Right. So that's what we get out of the auto runs. This box definitely has some persistence going on. So we'll minimize that one. The next thing we want to do, because there were registry keys involved and the auto run in that long command line referenced in registry key, I'm thinking there might be large registry keys. So logmd, we have the ability to run a minus rs. So if you come over here to logmd and we clear that out, I can run logmd and look for large registry keys by doing a minus rs. And it will generate, scan the registry for large keys. And what we end up getting is a report that looks like this and we're gonna we have two reports a small one and a large one this one if we open it up just gives us the um, short list of keys that are over that are 20k or larger that's our default starting point you can make it larger or smaller you can go down to 15k but you'll have more entries and what we're most interested in bam there's that frpru key right here right and so we highlight those yellow we know that's bad and again there's a security id it's just duplicates and you can see that the large register key uh, doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. So we have a whitelist for this as well with uh, LogMD Professional. And so watch the video on whitelisting 
uh, logmd and uh, large red keys and we'll actually walk you through how how we do that um, but what sticks out immediately is we have three values so now what initially was in the sticky bits are in the sticky bits and the interesting artifact report what was also in the run key is pointing me to this FLPRU location, and now I see three values, and one of them is 773K. That tells me it's probably a binary. These other ones could be binaries or scripts, don't know. Uh, we're in the mode of malware discovery at this point, so analysis isn't really our goal. We want to discover all the artifacts. The things we want to find are interesting artifacts, auto run persistence, large registry keys, which we've just gone through those three steps. And now we're going to take a look at is process created, the things that executed from all of this. So now we have three more artifacts that we can focus on on that FLPRU key. So let's minimize that. So let's go back to the reports. And let's look at process created. These are the things that executed as a part of the system uh, normally or by the bad guys. Now, immediately you can see these bunch of W event utils. That's just me clearing the logs before I infected the box. And so if you do a control T, Excel will give you the option, and this does have headers, to be able to do a quick uh, blue, white, every other line, and kind of widen some things, make it easy. And then you put it in, puts in uh, that. Excel puts you in filter mode. And the nice thing about that is I can grab certain things like this, this traffic that I knew I generated with the W event util, and I can go find it. And I can tell it, I can tell Excel to go ahead and turn that off. I don't need to see that data. And this is kind of how you cherry pick in, in Excel in the reports. Um, and, of course, you can also whitelist stuff. I'm, I'm cautious of ever get whitelisting out a, a log clear because um, generally a bad guy could do that. I want to see that. Uh, if I was using log management, so I would never filter out W event util. But here I know it's me. Or the other thing I can do is I can actually ex uh, filter out the name of the actual process itself. I generally don't like filtering out processes unless I'm certain uh, I've created it or there were no malicious intent of that process. And this would whack it all at once, so I can just basically go find. Uh, the W event util being executed and every one of them now will disappear if I just get rid of them so uh, boom they're all gone that makes the report a little, little more clean and so uh, what we see here is a big blank spot with a bunch of low PIDs and so this is an indication I rebooted the box cleared the logs rebooted the box and then uh, the persistence of the malware kicked in and executed which we just saw with the auto runs and the large edge keys and all that stuff and so now we're gonna say well what happened what actually how did it occur and so we know what we're looking for. We saw that the auto run launches MSHTA. Now you can just scroll through this, but since we have an artifact to look for, I can do a control find MSHTA, and it's gonna jump me down to when that process is executed. And there it is right here, right? So we can, we can blow this up a little bit and we'll move these over, um, get, get some more room here. And immediately um, I'm drawn to this. I will go ahead and make these yellow. I always make things I'm looking for yellow. Uh, there are two event IDs involved here. You see this 4688 and a 1. Uh, we can tell the 1's to go away. That's Sysmon. LogMD Professional collects Sysmon logs. And so initially I'll hide those just so we only have one entry of each. And what we can see here is this is where the malware first started running. Now, 4652 is the parent ID. If we widen this, we can see that it's the parent process ID. So 4652 is what started MSHTA. Now, since this is a run key, that's going to be Explorer. But we can go to the very beginning, since this did include all the logs and reboot. Control, control, find 4652. And we should then immediately find that uh, Explorer is actually 4652. So we'll highlight that as green because we know Explorer's good. It's it's you know started when you logged in. And so when you log in, obviously it reads all the run keys and that's where the persistence starts. So now we, we know that 4652 or anything else at this point involved with the malware that ran with Explorer, um, which is right here, and like obviously it opened up a DOS box, which probably is the thing that uh, um, started the their loads there are other run keys in your environment so there'll be multiple of these things running um, but 4062 isn't necessarily bad at this point it's probably good it is explorer it is the whole GUI th setup that you see and now we have a place to start we can say okay well this started so what else what else we see well we see a PowerShell right below it um, that was started by 5952 uh, well we know that's bad because the parent 
is this MSHTA. So we now know that these guys are bad, right? That guy's bad, that guy's bad. We highlight those red, make it a little easier to see. And now we can start tracking down to say, well, what else happened here? Um, this is just a LastPass running, so we don't have to worry about that one. I, I use LastPass on this laptop when I'm doing training. And I can say, all right, let's track what's going on. Um, 20, 2912 is bad. It's PowerShell. We got some interesting uh, parameter here. Remember all those other parameters we saw in the other stuff? So here's where they're doing it. Invoke expression, and they've got a T-O-I-A-U-Z-Z. -Z. Again, no, don't worry about what the value is there. We're looking to find the stuff. And we're going to highlight that yellow is bad. And we're going to look for other ones. 2912, here's another one. And here's where um, PowerShell is opening another Explorer. Aha. So now we, we know something else is involved here. We'll highlight those red. And then that Explorer, immediately 5016, opens up SysWow 64 Explorer. That is definitely interesting because SysWow 64 is where the 32-bit uh, binaries live. Yeah, Microsoft has a weird naming convention here. You would think the 64-bit ones live here, but they don't. It's backwards. And so now we have multiple explorers. Remember the two run keys, the startup folder, and then also the run key? So we have multiple explorers. The original one, which everything runs from, like what we're doing right now, and then the ones that were started by the malware. And so we can kind of continue down this path and say, well, did anything else start here? Are there any other uh, IDs that are they're associated with it. You know, here's the Intel RAID stuff. And we can kind of look down here to see if there's anything else. And it looks like the rest were all started with 764. And so this is basically our main payload right here. MSTHTA opened this JavaScript and did a bunch of, of stuff. Uh, PowerShell loaded, opened up uh, Explorer, which then opened up another Explorer. Now what that looks like, I unfortunately had to kill the malware in order to get the video to work, the recording to work. Uh, but I did capture the screen. So what we can see here, and using this is the Process Explorer screen, is the multiple um, instances of Explorer. And so this is what happens when this malware loads, is it's basically loading multiple explorers. And this is the Process Explorer view. Uh, we can also look at it in the uh, uh, Explorer view. This is just using Windows Explorer, and, but it doesn't give you the tree like the other one does, which is why Process Explorer is really nice. Uh, but you can see this is very unusual. There should only be one Explorer, and that's the GUI desktop that you're using. If there's multiple explorers, generally it's a bad thing. And so, boom, there's the, there's the um, behavior of the malware. We know there's PowerShell involved, which means now we can take a look at the PowerShell log. Is there a PowerShell log? Come down here, and sure enough, there is a PowerShell log. So we'll open this up. This is a text-based uh, report because of the uh, uh, sheer size of PowerShell logging. Um, here's W Event Util. So you know, in this case, this is, uh, this is me. Here's W Event Util, you know, because I did that. So I'm going to delete that because I know it's me. Just make it easier. Here's uh, another W Event Util. You can see that uh, there it is right there, and I'll take that down there, and there's W Event Util again, and I'll delete those, and there it is again. So you can do a little cleanup as you're doing it, you know, stuff you you've come to learn as uh, normal, and and now we got format default, we got W Event Util again, so we'll just keep doing this until we get rid of the, the noise that we know we had made when we before we rebooted the box. Um, get rid of some of these extra lines. All right, so now we've got this script block. Um, again, if you want to understand how to enable all this good logging, please we read the, uh, take a look at the Windows logging cheat sheet and the Windows PowerShell logging cheat sheet to learn how to enable uh, or what all the details are behind enabling the logs to collect this kind of data. And LogMD helps guide you to setting these things. Um, but here you go. Here's some interesting script blocks that were captured in PowerShell. And again, you can match the time to the report, which is now when I'm going to show you this. Uh, Excel does not import log time correctly, and so you have to do a little tweak. You have to take the reports, the Excel spreadsheets, and uh, I don't want the column width. I want the properties. Right-click the format cells, and you come down here to custom. I'm going to move this over. You come down here to custom and go to the very bottom, and you'll see the same time format that you would expect to see without seconds. So you go up here and you click on it, on the type, and you put in colon ss.1230, only three zeros, that's all Excel will accept, and then it'll properly format your time. And so now uh, we have uh, something that uh, can be referenced in other reports. 1813 is roughly when this MSHTA started, and also when these two explorers started, 1813. So we can come down here and say, well, at 1813, PowerShell started, right? So we know 1813, bam, there's your correlation of time. 
that this PowerShell did an invoke expression of a very large base64 string of all this stuff. Again, we're in discovery mode, but you can base64 reverse this to see what the script does. Um, and you can see uh, more data as well, another block of, of script. And then uh, you can start seeing some of the stuff that was actually uh, executed. And now you start to see, you can see there's a sleep involved with this malware. And you can see, again, we're still at 1813, so we know there's a correlation of time. And we can see some of the parameters and, and variables that are involved, and now some of the details. Uh, here's some byte blocks and, and stuff that's going on with the PowerShell. So we've discovered some PowerShell artifacts that potentially can be looked at later. Uh, we know we know we have a time frame in which to look at it, so we know that's that's involved with this as well. So we have lots of behavior. All right, so we found interesting artifacts. We found auto runs and persistence, large registry keys, processes created. Um, now, we have the processes created. Did it communicate outbound? So let's take a look at that. We have uh, multiple reports here when it comes to IP connections, and LogMD actually has a minus uh, W or who is option that you can run. And so you have to be network connected for this. And there's the large uh, interesting artifacts being, being done. So I'll clear this. And when you run LogMD, uh, what you want to do is you're going to do minus one for one day or two days, whatever you want to do. And you want to specify the minus W. And what's going to happen is it's going to collect the logs. It's going to take all the IP related information that's in the connections, which is the Windows firewall or the Sysmon network connection logs. And it's going to um, build these reports with the Whois information. Now what these are is no browsers and browsers. And the reason uh, you won't see the browsers, there aren't any reports, um, because I did not launch the browsers part of uh, this infection. Uh, but a general user desktop would have a browser report as well. And the reason we split browser and no browser is generally malware is going to use a non-browser connection. In this case, we saw PowerShell Explorer and SysWow64 Explorer. And that's why we split those. We generally focus at non-browser traffic first, get our time frame, the 18, you know, 1813 set, figure out where our, our, time, uh, our timeline is. And then we can go look at the browser window to maybe say, well, did this user surf something that got them infected one, three, five minutes? minutes beforehand and you can investigate those URLs and whatnot. But we're interested right now in the non-browser. And this is going to be uh, all the IP addresses that are involved here. We can blow this up a little bit. And you can see uh, LogMD will provide you, this is what the minus W does, it provides you the owner, the network, the owner, the network, the range, who is information, uh, and who the registrar was. The nice thing about this is it gives you a really quick ability. Again, control T. We'll say, yep, it has a header. And we can say, all right, we know that certain things that are trusted that aren't involved here. Um, I'm going to get rid of Microsoft because I can. And we know that Microsoft is generally OK, though, remember, it could be in inappropriately using by pulling down data from OneDrive or pushing data to OneDrive. But I'm going to go ahead and just, again, cherry pick by getting rid of Microsoft Corporation at the top. And we can see Akamai was involved, right? So some content sharing. But we also tell you what the binary is that's calling it. So you can see that Explorer and Foxit and things like that are what are calling um, uh, these these domains. Um, and, and we can decide whether or not they're important or, again, we're not getting rid of them. We're just hiding them at the moment. And we can tell Akamai to go away. We're just trying to get rid of some noise. And, and then all of a sudden we see here, by getting rid of those just those simple items, is now the thing we know that's bad, the, the binary that's bad, SysWow64, is talking out to all these IP addresses. So we're going to highlight all these yellow. And you can just see it goes on and on and on and on. This is a dead giveaway indicator that there's probably some Tor going on or it's looping through a whole bunch of uh, addresses. And so now we have a focal point of bad IPs. And the very first IP that triggered here is a Japanese IP. Here's some Fox at software talking to Amazon. So uh, we know we can probably get rid of Amazon. Uh, but this gives us a really quick country information, the IP address, the range. So if you did want to set up a block, generally I blacklist, I black hold. I don't uh, blacklist IPs when I'm doing investigations until I'm all done and I make sure I have everything. And you can put these, for example, these IPs can be put into your uh, a query for your network firewalls, and that can give you an indication of anybody else who might have visited these sites, which potentially means they're infected. And so now we have the connection information. So interesting artifacts proved the system was compromised with uh, null bytes 
Sticky keys is something I added for the demo. Auto runs, persistence, we saw that very quickly of how the malware loaded. We saw large registry, registry keys were involved. We're going to take a look at that detail in a minute. Now we just looked at the process execution. We got a pattern which led us to Syswow 64 Explorer. We look at the network connections. We can see that Syswow 64 Explorer is phoning outbound. Uh, sending data or retrieving data and so that comes to back in the question how much data is leaving this box is it really stealing data is this mostly inbound communication well logmd has a new option thanks to, to microsoft and a new feature that uh, not many people are aware of but there is a sh uh, an item called shrum uh, system resource utilization monitor and actually if you go to task manager and you open this up and you go to performance it's this item way down here and you open that up, you can see the network performance here. And as it builds the list of information, you can see total bytes received and sent uh, in regards to it. It'll start building, right, CPU average. It'll start building a list of stuff going in and out of the, the image. And so this is stored in a database that's dumped every hour. And so the cool thing about that is LogMD, while the system's live, we can query that Shrum database. Now there's an important note. It flushes every hour. That means in a lab environment, I clear the logs, I infect the box, I run logmd, and I run the minus s shrum option. I'm not necessarily going to catch anything at that point because if if shrum if uh, the shrum dump happened at 12 to the database and I ran this at 12:15, I now have to wait till 1 p.m. before that information is pushed to the database. So the minus s minus s shrum option is useful. Uh, but this is how you run it. You just go ahead and and do a minus s, uh, bam, it immediately takes a dump of the database. It is sometimes locked, and so we make a request, and we wait, and you'll see it probably say locked, waiting for about five, six tries, and boom, it'll cut it out. And then what you get is this cool report. And this report, when you open it, will show you uh, the timestamp. It's, it's pretty thin, um, but you do have to know the binary you're looking for, okay? And again, it's in reverse time, so what I'm going to do is take this data and sort it. I'm actually, let's do the control T, it's the fastest way to do it. And I'm going to take this data and sort it newest to oldest um, because I want to look at today's date. Now, the other thing is, here's all the binaries, and here's the data sent and data received. So we now know from looking at the other report uh, that that uh, SysWow 64 Explorer is the thing communicating outbound. And so, again, with the power of Excel, what I can do is say, just show me anything with SysWow 64, filter that down, and now we can see very quickly that this box um, is communicating outbound, sending uh, these many bytes. You can kind of cheat here. You can actually do this and do an auto sum and then get the amount of bytes. So now you can actually calculate. Let's uh, blow this up. Make this much bigger. And you can actually uh, see that it's... Uh, uh, 708,000, 708 million bytes, but we in LogMD, we actually give you the ability to uh, uh, see the human readable form of it. We actually convert it for you to kilobytes and megabytes, and so it makes your calculations much easier. And so you can do some little math here. Um, but the other really cool thing that Shrum provides you is not only how many bytes were sent out or how much data was lost, but also when potentially the box was first infected. Now, the Shrum database holds 60 days of data. Now, if you notice, the 14th, so July 14th, when this video, uh, when this data was created, uh, and the video was made uh, shortly thereafter, um, shows that this machine was communicating on the 14th, the 12th, the 11th, the 10th, the 9th, the, 7th, the 8th, the 7th, and the 6th. And then there's no entries after the 6th. Okay, that means we know right now that this box potentially was infected July 6th, 2017, and that it lost this much data. And so that's what the Shrum database can provide you. And I'm going to show you one that we left running for a couple months to see what that would look like. And you know, if you just clear everything, select all. And we got to get rid of all. Oops, we got to get rid of all the filtering, so we can see the entire date. So we can see this if we sort it now. Um, oldest, we can see the first date is July 3rd, right? So we now know by doing what we just did that the box was initially infected for a couple weeks. We know how many bytes were sent. We can determine whether how much data either is on this box and what that really represents. Was that a couple Word docs? Did it? Does our database, did that database size, you know, uh, look like that data in quantity? And you can kind of take an interpretation of how much data left the box and when you were first infected. So that's how the NetFlow Shrum data works. So we now know 
uh, interesting artifacts, auto runs persistence, large registry keys, processes created, network connections, and NetFlow. Okay, what we haven't done is looked at the details of the files or folders yet or the registry. So let's take a look at one of the options that you can configure for your systems, especially if you're doing a lab, um, is that you can, with LogMD, collect uh, file auditing and registry auditing if you configure it. For example, if I want to actually uh, uh, audit a folder, I would have to go find that folder, see users root app data local, right click on it, properties, security, advanced, auditing, continue, and add the user everyone. And then as you can see, I've set some permissions here, create files, create folders, write attributes, write extended attributes, delete, change, and take ownership. That means any file that's created through Explorer and will be recorded in the logs. And so you can create, you can actually monitor and log for creates, adds, and changes, and deletes. You don't ever want to do reads that will make, that, that makes the logs four times as big and, and accesses aren't something really, uh, as IR people are necessarily concerned with initially, or malware discovery is anyway, uh, forensics maybe, but not, uh, not for malware discovery in, in IR. And so you can set this logging up. If you do, let's take a look at the kinds of things you can you can capture. And this includes not just file items, but also registry items. You would have to right click the run key in the registry and say, I wanna audit that. And so this is uh, right here, you can see, we'll make these uh, bold so you can see them. Uh, this is the process that made the change. This is the value that changed. Now remember that we have two things we can look for. We can look for um, the FLPRU key. I can tell you right now that uh, I don't tend to do registry auditing on, on the software key, but I do watch the user's key. So I set for the current user, I always set, especially in my malware labs, the C users, Bob, app data local, app data local low, and app data roaming. So we had that folder, if you remember way back in the beginning, uh, we had that folder of, um, uh, let's see if I can find it, of 3466 right here, right? This 3466 app data local. So we can look for that in the uh, auditing report that I just uh, minimized. We can look for that, control find, 3466. And what we should do is jump down to that folder, um, or at least around that, that folder area, and we can immediately highlight this saying, okay, Explorer, and hey, look at here, SysWow64 Explorer. We could have also looked for that, and maybe that's what we do here in a second. Um, created a batch file as well as a link, and hey, there's that 9E53 link. And so we see that information, and we can actually focus on that, and we can see um, that there were some files that were created as well as, we, if we, you can see the run key was referenced here, we can, we can scroll over here and say, well, it looks like the run key was uh, involved in the Explorer. Um, I don't see any writes at this point, but we can keep looking, see if there's any more information. 3466, and nope, that's it. And so another thing I tend to look at, and we can of course look at the SysWow 64 in a second, but I generally want to see what's in temp as well. Now temp can be noisy on a typical workstation, uh, the user's creating and doing a lot of things, um, but in a lab it's really useful to look at. And so we can look at temp and immediately see, uh, which is what we're going to look at next, uh, because it was real obvious, is that these are bad. There's there's PowerShell doing its thing. And there was a PS1 and a PSM, so a, PS, a PowerShell module and a PowerShell script were executed from the local temp directory in, in regards to this malware. So we're suddenly getting more. All right, now I know for certain SysWow64 is important, so we can do the same thing we did before. Set the uh, items here and go ahead and say, show me everything that has SysWow64 which is 32-bit stuff, and there you can immediately see I found all the items. And so we know we have even more information than we had before. We now have a batch file involved, and we have two PowerShell scripts. They're, they may or may not be there because malware tends to uh, drop files and delete files uh, very quickly. Um, but again, the whole title of this, this, uh, this, <laughs> this video was Fileless Malware. I don't know about you, but to me, this is not fileless malware. Um, anyway, so uh, we now have some files and folders. So we've looked kind of through the reports of what, what we can see with LogMD logging. So now we're to the point where we want to actually go investigate. So let's take a look. Let's actually go to C users, root, app data, local. Let's 
sort this correctly. Uh, 3466. We can see the 12th is on here, so something updated in the 12th. And lo and behold, uh, we can see that there is a batch file. And of course, at this point, we're going to start investigating things and actually open and look at these things. And now we can start seeing some of these weird variables that are occurring. And then look, here's that funny, funny file name that's right below it. Um, we can see that was uh, start this thing. There's a variable involved, a bunch of echoes, which are probably used by other scripts. This is the way the bad guys can obfuscate exactly what they're doing. Um, but we have another piece of information and an artifact. So if we had more than one user, two, three, four users infected with this, because let's say we looked in the wind, we looked, we asked the network guys, or we looked in the firewall logs and found three systems went to one or more of those IPs that we saw in the connections report, we now know what artifacts to go out and find. We know this app data local 3466 is involved. We know MSHTA uh, has a registry key involved, which we're going to look at next. We can go to the uh, local temp. Let's see if there's any files left in local temp. I do not see those PowerShell scripts, so they came and went, which is pretty typical when you see the temp folder involved. But always look. You never know. Um, but we definitely have this directory here, so we know this is a part of it. And now let's take a look at the registry. So we're going to open regedit because I want to show you that error that happens when you click on the uh, keys. So if I come up here and I go to HQ current user software, that's it. And there's FLPRU, by the way. And I just saw right here that there's another funny folder with some interesting values. We'll come back to that. So I want to show you Microsoft Windows current version. Uh, here's the run key, right? This We saw this in the LogMD reports. But see what happens when... Uh, when you go to this key is that it throws an error and this is what the null byte does and so if i hit ok there's two of them they got two bleeps because there were two values but i do see that one drive right because that's normal and here's a little trick for you if you double click the uh, item and just hit ok and then go out of the key come back in you'll see that there's two new entries now you really can't delete them they just give you an indication that there is something there and so you definitely know at this point you got something fishy so there's a little trick just go into the default hit OK, come out, F F5, or just come out of a key and back into the key. And now you can actually verify this in values there. You will still have to delete the run key and then recreate these other values that are normal if you want to clean this box. Now before we go and look at the FLPRU key, I want to go back to something we saw in the 3466 directory, this file right here, the 6FC5, but most importantly, the .F90C1 extension. Now in Windows, when you double click this, like a batch file, or a link shortcut, it'll actually, it has a determined thing. A batch file will open command shell and execute. 9e53.link will open the shortcut that's within the link file. But this guy here, F90C1, is interesting to me because if you double click that, in naturally in Windows, nothing will happen. And so I'm going to look in the registry for the file association that's associated with that. And the way we do that is in the registry, we can go up to the H key classes root key. If we expand that, uh, we can scroll down here or just do a find, control find dot uh, F90 and hit OK. And what it'll do is it'll come find this file extension. You can see all the file extensions are in here. And what this does is it builds the behavior that Windows will do when you double click this file. And you can see in here there's a default value. There's a value of B7B9. And it's pretty typical to have another key to then tell you how to open it. For example, this would give another key if it was dot doc to then go tell you to open WinWord when you double clicked it. So now we want to look for this B7B9 because that's interesting. What is that value? So we'll do a control find B7B9 and we'll jump down here and we'll actually find this key. Now this is a shell open key so that means what's going to happen when you double click it. And what we'll find here, let's uh, shrink this screen a bit so we can see the values better. Here we'll and move this over to the right, is if we open up, open this up, you can see that there is that famous uh, H key current user reg FLPRU again. That's why I wanted to come here first. And this is the MSHTA. So that means if I double click that F90C1 blah, 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 that dot F90 file, it will associate to this key and this command. And so in essence, instead of opening up WinWord, it will just execute this script. And that's another piece that was found in the course of, of hunting for uh, this information. So now let's go back to uh, what we were doing. So let's go back um, to, to the software key, just to just get rid of Microsoft here. And let's focus at FLPRU. That is an artifact that we saw. Uh, we just happened to see 
the um, other weird key right below it which has something similar may or may not be related but um, I can tell you right now that's pretty that's pretty weird um, looks like a big chunk of, of obfuscated stuff so like a script uh, maybe there's an equal sign at the end let's see if there is are they an equal signs um, yep there is so this is potentially a base 64 encoded script hidden in the registry in that key but in FLPRU, remember we saw multiple keys, this LGFG, this uh, MIK, which initially was pointed to here. And suddenly there's a bunch of keys. And we can open these and look at them. There's, again, a bunch, bunch of data uh, that are in here. They're, they're, well, that one's blank. Well, at least it shows blank, but there's data in it. Um, so there's probably a trick going on there, maybe another null byte. And, uh, and we can see uh, some various things going on here. So now we know this key and potentially this key are involved in this malware payload. So we have the files and folders involved. We saw that the uh, 3466 file definitely was involved. The startup folder, right? So we can see what the startup folder looks like. If we go here, app data, roaming, Microsoft, Windows, start menu, programs, startup. We can see the property here. This is the file uh, that is the other startup location and again just doing the same exact thing launching mshta uh, loading going to this reg key loading the value flpru mcmic and the reason we have two of those like we showed earlier is because uh, this thing has multiple explorers running and so you now have an idea of how to kill the malware because of all those explorers uh, a pretty good trick is you can actually uh, kill malware a lot of times if it's hooked in explorer by calling task manager uh, going to details here you can use process explorer my preferred tool and find the thing you want to kill even if it's just a dll that's hooked in explorer and you can end the task um, and then while task manager is still open or with control delete run task manager you can actually restart uh, explorer just by typing in the path see windows backslash explorer.exe um, there you go and you could actually restart Explorer and bring it back, uh, but you can unhook a lot of malware that way. So it's just a little trick, especially since this one's a heavy use on Explorer. And so we can see the shortcuts in here. So we now know we can clean this up. So we found everything that probably is involved from a file registry hook, right? The, the snake. We found the fangs, the persistence auto runs. We found the venom, the payload that's in 3466 directory and in the FLPRU key here. So we can blow those away, clean the box. We probably would have to, remember there's multiple explorers, so you can't try to delete these keys and these, these files until you've unhooked the malware, um, or you're just going to issue a re-image for this user. You know that the box is infected from a period of time, not just today or yesterday, but for a couple weeks. Um, we know the registry keys involved. Uh, we know files that were dropped. We saw some batch files that were created. We saw some PowerShell scripts that were created as part of this malware. And we basically found all these good things in regard to this fileless malware. And, uh, and that's everything you need to know. And the next step would be re-image or you do have enough information here to actually remediate the boxes. So that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. The malware we discovered in this video is Coopter. You can read more at the Semantic website and get the details that they found along with ours and do some comparisons. Thanks for watching.